A pedestrian on 57th Street in New York City sees Yasha Heifetz, a famous violinist from the Russian Empire, and asks him, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? To which Heifetz replies, practice, practice, practice. Practice, practice, practice. Practice, practice, practice. Practice, practice, <laughs> practice. <laughs> Virtually every American knows this joke because Carnegie Hall on 57th Street in New York City is America's greatest concert venue. And it's no surprise that the joke should center around a musician from the Russian Empire, because many of the greatest performances in Carnegie Hall's history have actually been by Russians and Russian Americans. For 130 years, lucky concert goers have filled the combined 3,671 seats of Carnegie Hall for one of its 250 annual performances. The hall actually incorporates three different performance spaces. The Isaac Stern Auditorium, the largest and grandest of the three, Zenkel Hall, a versatile space that can be configured for a variety of different performances, and the Weill Recital Hall, which is the smallest of the three venues, with just 268 seats. These three spaces inhabit a beautiful Renaissance Revival building designed by architect William Burnett Tuthill. But the majesty of Carnegie Hall only exists because of the remarkable generosity of one man, the hall's namesake, Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie was born in 1835 in Dunfermline, Scotland, in a one-room weaver's cottage that his parents shared with another family. In 1848, his parents moved to America in search of a better life. Carnegie made wise investments with the money he made as a telegraph operator and eventually became a steel magnate. In 1901, when he sold his Carnegie Steel Company to industrialist J.P. Morgan, he became the wealthiest man in America. Carnegie believed in philanthropy, and during the last 18 years of his life, he gave away the equivalent of over $5 billion in today's money. As a great proponent of the power of literacy and self-education, he funded 3,000 libraries. And in 1890, he personally funded the construction of what was then called the Music Hall in New York City. It was later renamed Carnegie Hall in his honor. Due to its location in New York City and the high quality of its acoustics, Carnegie Hall quickly became the premier classical music venue in America. But the very first performance at Carnegie was conducted by world-renowned Russian composer Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky was the first Russian composer to find international fame. After a storied career composing such masterpieces as Swan Lake and the Patetique Symphony, he sought to promote Russian music around the world as a conductor. And so, on the opening night of Carnegie Hall, May 5th, 1891, Tchaikovsky conducted a performance of his Festival Coronation March with the orchestra of the New York Music Society. Celebrated Russian composer and pianist Sergei Rachmaninoff made his Carnegie Hall debut in 1909, playing his second piano concerto, Rachmaninoff left a successful career as a composer and performer in Russia amidst the turmoil of the revolutions of 1917. He used a concert tour of Scandinavia as a pretext to escape the Soviet Union with his family and ultimately settled in New York City. Rachmaninoff would go on to perform at Carnegie Hall countless times up until his death in 1943. At the same time Rachmaninoff was fleeing the revolution, a brilliant 16-year-old Russian violinist from the Russian Empire, Yasha Heifetz, was making his Carnegie Hall debut. Heifetz was born in Vilnius in 1901. His father was a violin teacher, and Heifetz was a child prodigy, making his public debut in Lithuania at the age of seven. He and his family immigrated to the U.S. in 1917, Heifetz was declared the greatest violinist since Paganini, and he performed at Carnegie Hall numerous times until shoulder surgery ended his performing career in 1972. 
In 1958, 23-year-old American pianist Van Cliburn won the gold medal in Russia's first international piano competition. Cliburn was a Texan who studied at the Juilliard School in New York and made his Carnegie Hall debut at age 20. In 1958, at the height of the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, he competed in the International Tchaikovsky Competition in Moscow, an event designed to demonstrate Soviet cultural superiority. Clyburn's performance garnered an eight-minute standing ovation from the Russian audience. And the Russian judges, fearing the political ramifications of allowing an American to win the competition, asked for special permission from Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev to give Clyburn the first prize. Permission was granted, and Van Clyburn returned to America to a hero's welcome, a ticker tape parade through the streets of New York City, and a triumphant performance at Carnegie Hall. The tradition of exceptional Russian performances at Carnegie Hall continues to this day with violinist Maxime Mostyn. Uh, my dad was a pianist. He was the pianist at uh, Moskonsert, which is like the, the association of professional musicians in Moscow. Uh, my parents had this dream that they wanted to, they wanted to move to America. And then, you know, then we left in, in May of 1979. And so we did a concert at Weill Hall, I want to say in 1982 or 1983, and that was, that was my Carnegie Hall debut. Maxime played Carnegie Hall for the first time when he was just 12 years old and continues to perform there regularly with the New York Choral Society, Musica Sacra, the Manhattan Festival Orchestra, and others. His career is living proof that Russian musicians continue to imbue Carnegie Hall with greatness. I mean, this, I've played in a lot of great stages. And physically, there's no, the, the, the feeling of playing at Carnegie Hall is very, very special. The hall just gives you everything you want. It doesn't matter what, what you're playing, how you're playing, it makes you, it makes you feel better about it. You know, um, and, and then if you start thinking about all the amazing, amazing music that's been created on that stage before you, then it just puts everything in perspective and then hopefully you play a little bit better because of it. Carnegie Hall, please. Carnegie Hall has played host to many other notable performances and not just of classical music. On January 6, 1938, the Benny Goodman Orchestra gave the first performance of big band jazz at the hall, later released as a record album. This concert marked one of the first times an audience sat to listen to jazz and one of the first performances where black and white performers appeared together on an American concert stage. On November 14, 1943, Conductor Bruno Walter became suddenly ill and was unable to perform at Carnegie Hall. An unknown 25-year-old named Leonard Bernstein conducted in his place. The concert was broadcast on radio and Bernstein became an overnight sensation. And on February 12, 1964, the Beatles performed two shows at Carnegie during their first tour of the United States. Incredibly, despite its status as one of the greatest concert venues in the world, Carnegie Hall was in danger of being demolished in the 1950s. The Glickman Corporation, a commercial real estate developer, planned to tear down the hall and build a 44-story skyscraper in its place. But thankfully, world-famous violinist Isaac Stern helped to engineer a deal saving it from destruction. In appreciation for his efforts, the main auditorium was renamed in Stern's honor, and in 1964, Carnegie Hall was designated a national landmark. Thanks to this designation, Carnegie Hall remains one of the great venues of American high culture to this day. But in the tradition of the American melting pot, the most notable performances on its stages have been by immigrants and artists from other countries. 
Russia, with its great and storied musical culture, has provided Carnegie Hall with the most memorable of these performances for the past 130 years and continues to do so even today. Carnegie Hall has, um, has been central to, I think, all, all of our uh, musical lives. Playing at Carnegie Hall is always a privilege, no matter what we're playing, no matter how we're feeling, you get up on that stage and you, you feel better about yourself. It's, it's, it's a hallowed stage, hallowed ground, or whatever. Yeah.